Okay, so I, I will, I, I prepare a presentation to talk about three things uh, because I, I have to do a, a little disclaimer before I begin, that is that we don't really have a future foresight institution in the government right now. We have like these little initiatives like the team that was at the Ministry of Science or, or the unit that I'm, uh, I'm chief of right now. Uh, so we have these little initiatives, but there's no uh, an articulate strategy for, for anticipation or, or future planning. So um, I will first talk about some uh, theoretical constructs. I, I believe they are, are interesting for this exercise. And, and, and in particular, one topic of research that I work on that were natural laboratories. And from that, I will see how, how we would work on thinking about the future and, and trying to work towards future scenarios, not from a deficit model, and that's the first thing I, I want to talk to about, but from an opportunity model. And, and from that, I will talk with specific examples of what of different things that we've done at the Ministry of Science, and, and after that, at the Ministry of Economy, where I am right now. So uh, the presentation is divided in three parts. Uh, if you want to ask something, uh, please raise your hand. I, I don't know how you participate here, but I, I'll happy to interact with you during my presentation. Um, so, I, and, and I, I will go like this little theoretical part at the beginning, talking about deficit model, and, and then I will go into natural laboratories and, and the Chilean STI policy more, in, more generally. So first, um, some context I want to give, maybe you, you've seen some of this during this course, I don't know. Uh, but the first thing I want to say is that we operate in a complex socio-technical system. So, so we have like this structure and organizations that interact with a physical system and at the same time interact with people and with tasks. And these systems are socially constructed and at the same time are socially shaping. So we have this, and this we can talk about technology in general where Technology evolves, and at the same time, it influences how people uh, in, uh, how people interact and how society evolves too. Uh, we can think on technology as a tool that is separated from society uh, or from or, or from people, uh, and we are different as persons uh, right now with the technology we've developed during the last years and and in general during all the human history. Uh, and in the last 50 years, more or less, or 70 years, different models have been developed to think on how we can use science and technology for development and, and to, to pursue societal goals. And the first one is the linear model, of, and that's innovation for growth. And that's around uh, 1960, more or less, uh, after the Second World War, uh, when they realized that basic research could uh, lead to development. Uh, the Second World War was a, a good example on how basic research led to the to the uh, nuclear bomb and some other examples. But and, and, and science advanced, advanced really fast. Uh, around that time, also system engineering was born and and to develop large technological projects and and and, and, and so on. So they realized that and different governments started to work on how you can transfer basic research into applied research. And from that applied research where you can buy technology, you can foster development and, and, and more research that towards development. And then you will have more production and, and you will foster economy and everything. Um, that linear model is something that is mostly obsolete right now, but it, still you can see it in, in most, uh, in, in different science and technology policies, and 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 it's like under all the all the shape all the different policies that yeah you have uh, in both in development developing and develop developed countries. But after this linear model, you have uh, different different people started thinking about this and 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 how you can relate different actors within society and different more complex models were, uh, were, were created. Uh, one of them that is uh, pretty well known is the triple helix that related ac academia, government and industry and said that all the competitiveness and regional development depended on, on the interaction of these three actors. 
uh, and how you can foster innovation and entrepreneurship by uh, fostering uh, the participation of academia in the industry and at the same time its relation with government. And they start realizing that institutions were important and it was not only fostering basic, basic research and applied research to foster development, but you can you had also to have a, a, a good a good ecosystem and, and and that led around 1980s to the national innovation systems model. And, and that's the idea is that you have in a country or in a region, because you have also regional innovation systems, different firms, academia that is related with uh, with institutions and government, and you have like a national capacity on innovation and on science and technology. And that is related with uh, your level of human capital, on, on your level of, of innovation on firms, on how uh, university transfer knowledge to firms and how they also uh, generate basic and applied research and uh, uh, all the infrastructure that you have. Um, and in the last couple of, years, maybe decade, you have like a third model uh, that is, this is not that the two other models are wrong, but that comes to complement these, these two other models. That's the transformative change model and the expansion of the triple helix into a five helix. Uh, it's uh, where you include society and also you include uh, environment. Uh, and, and basically what you have here is that it's, it depends on what's the focus of the policy. If you are like uh, using a linear model, a national innovation systems model, or this transformative change model. And this last model, what says is that you, you can have a so societal and environmental challenges. And the focus of this SDI policy should be those challenges and not directly innovation. And like by, uh, uh, by addressing these challenges, you will have more innovation and you will have more economic growth, but you don't have to, uh, to address specifically innovation or basic research in general, but you have to face these challenges and in that way you will face innovation and you will have innovation and, and, and growth. And something that's very interesting is, and it's something that I've been researching in the last couple of years, uh, is that most of these models what have in common is that they usually, uh, are based on a deficit model. And this deficit logic says that you need to address some, something because you lack something. Uh, normally what you lack is innovation. So you say to have more development, you need more innovation. To face this societal change, you need more innovation. To uh, face environmental challenges, you need more innovation. And the problem with that is that while you are facing every problem as a deficit with, from a deficit model, you only have one kind of response to those problems. And that usually are the same kind of policy that we've been developing uh, in the last century in around science and technology, and that are usually policies that are top-down constructed, uh, that uh, does, doesn't incorporate uh, a lot of public engagement and public participation. And even though some models like the transformative change model includes more, more participation and, and different, for example, mission-oriented policy or uh, from Matugat or some other uh, ideas have emerged. Those are seen mostly seen as a democratic deficit model of innovation, where you the deficit is maybe not innovation, but the participation. Um, so this critique to these models that are based on a deficit logic uh, is especially important in emerging economies because in emerging economies we are we have a lot of deficit and we have a lot of gaps to fill. But maybe the uh, maybe there's another way where we don't have to think on what we lack, but we can think on what we have, and from that we can build better policies thinking on science and technology. And that's a little of what I'm going to talk about now. Specifically, I, I be, I've been working with the concept of natural laboratories and, and complex innovation and partnerships, and, and how from this uh, territory-centered approach, you can build STI policies from, uh, to think about the future and to uh, face future challenges. So in particular in Chile, we, we have a, a lot of very unique geographical places uh, and that have developed some specific scientific and technological uh, areas. And one of them is astronomy. And, and I've 
I studied the Atacama Desert since 2015 until 20, 2020 that I finally published my paper. Uh, so I, I will talk a little bit about natural laboratories and, and in particular the Atacama Desert and, and, and how astronomy has, has developed and, and how from astronomy we can build, uh, we can build science and technology policy. So first, natural laboratories are a theoretical construct that comes from uh, the policy practice side. Uh, it was created around 2020, 2010, more or less, in, in the CONICIT, that is like the uh, National Research and Education Agency that right now it's called ANIT, that's National Research and Development Agency. Um, and it has to do with what makes the country unique in geographical terms. And, and Chile has a lot of really unique geographical things. For example, we have the highest level of solar radiation in the world in the Atacama Desert. Also in the desert, we have the clear skies of the planet. Uh, we have a lot of islands and islets, and, and, and we are one of the countries with most islands. We have a lot of, of very high peaks in the Andes mountain. We have uh, one of the largest freshwater reserves. Uh, we have a lot of lakes. We are the country that is more. It's most. Uh, the, we are the south, the most uh, southern country, and, and like the the gate to Antarctica, and a lot of different unique characteristics. And through this study, uh, we define these natural laboratories that we that was a concept that was being used during a lot of time without a lot of, of, of conceptual development. And in our research, we define them as sites with unique or hardly replicable geographic characteristics that enable competitive advantages for the advancement of science and technology at global scale. And what that this definition means and how we came with this definition, it's we have like three very important components. So first, we wanted to, to uh, close the definition only two geographic characteristics because natural laboratories uh, was starting to being used for everything. And if you have a concept that is useful for everything at the same time, it is, it's useful for, for now. So we, we wanted to differentiate a, a, a natural laboratories from other similar concepts like, like that maybe you have heard like test beds or living laboratories or, or some others that are being used. So we focus on geographical characteristics. For example, the uh, Atacama Desert has like uh, a unique, we have in our, in our cast lines the, the Humboldt current and some other currents that make uh, our skies very clear because of the current. We have our mountains very close to the sea and that's another very unique characteristic of, it, of the desert. We have very high sites uh, that are very plateaus that are, are very high, like, like 5,000 meters high plateaus. Um, we have like very low, very dry uh, skies in, uh, in the north, and, and all these characteristics are unique from the Atacama Desert. If you think on some possible different natural laboratories, we have Antarctica. Chile is the, the country that is closer to Antarctica. It's the closest to Antarctica. And we have this very unique uh, ice where you can, for example, catch neutrinos, and it's the only place in the world where you can catch neutrinos. Uh, you have like a uh, uh, water and the ocean in general near Antarctica that is very sensitive to climate change. And, and for example, when you change only one degree in the equator, you have like four or five degrees that have changed um, in the Antarctica. So it's like a, a, an early warning uh, alarm system uh, for climate change. And we, you have a lot of unique, very unique characteristics at the Antarctica and subantarctic region. Uh, and in that sense, natural laboratories were not tested not living laboratories, mostly because since they were based on geographic characteristics, they cannot be man-made. And that's what makes them different from test beds or living laboratories that are usually man construct, main construct. Uh, you can create a test bed for a technology. You can create a living laboratory for a technology. You cannot create a natural laboratory. You can exploit the natural laboratory. You can modify it. It, you can destroy it, but you can create it. Um, the second thing is that this natural laboratory uh, is not only that you have this unique characteristic, that, but it also can create a competitive advantage over other countries or regions. And in the case of the Atacama Desert, uh, Chile has uh, right now the clearest 
skies for astronomical observation. And that is translated that we have like 70% of the world observation capacity installed in Chile. Uh, that's, there are different numbers. The 70% is considering uh, telescopes that are larger, lar four meters uh, wide or larger. Uh, and that's, uh, those are the, the telescopes that are working at the frontier. But also we have ALMA, for example, that is the most uh, advanced radio telescope right now in the world. Uh, so we have like some of the most advanced telescopes in the Atacama Desert. Uh, we have like 70% of the observation capacity. If you think only on the Southern Hemisphere, that uh, some, some things in the sky can only be seen from the Southern Hemisphere, oh. you have like 96% of the observation. So it's mo mostly uh, all the astronomy of the Southern Hemisphere has to be observed from Chile. Um, in the case of, of Antarctica, and that's not specifically Chile because it's, it's international territory, but you have, for example, this ice cube uh, laboratory, uh, observatory, sorry, where you can see neutrinos or observe neutrinos uh, through the ice. And it's a uh, very, interesting effect where neutrinos when travel through ice they travel uh, slower than light so they uh, faster than light so they generate a special effect in the ice that can be detected through sensors and you can study neutrinos uh, in, in in the antarctica and the third thing that we defined was that this natural laboratory should have global impact that's because maybe you can have a very specific little plant in the Amazona that it's unique in the world, but maybe that's Thank interesting you know, only for a couple of, of mm. first, a couple of people, and only uh, they you? interact with that plant, and it doesn't generate it doesn't generate any impact to the world. Uh, so in order to make this concept of natural laboratories useful for policy and useful for science and technology policy in particular, we define them as as uh, uh, unique places that have a global impact. In the case of Chile, it's clear that we have like two thirds of the optical observation capacity. So it's obvious that it has global impact. Uh, at the same time, if you think on Antarctica, it's the only place where you can watch neutrinos right now. Uh, if you think on the south, uh, the south of Chile, it's the place where satellites pass through the through air, uh, uh, above Earth uh, most times. So you can catch more data than any other place. Uh, if you think on the on Chile on the Chilean coast, it's the it's the longest coast. So you have like more. Uh, I think that it's like uh, eighty or ninety percent of the different climates of the world in the same coast. So you can compare it, and it's something that's also very unique. Uh, if you can see here, you can see the share of of Chilean observation capacity with different uh, way of measuring it. Not only the area. Uh, this is seventy percent is the area of observation time. You have the field of view, that's another different way of, of measuring, and the ethn view, that's another different uh, way of, of, of measuring that involves time, involves uh, also the, the angular capacity and everything. And in any way that we can measure the capacity, Chile has uh, this uh, very important uh, impact in the world of observation. And an example, maybe you remember the, the, the picture of the black hole. Uh, here is an example on how you, how the picture was and how it would have been without the observatories in Chile. Uh, and, the, and as you can see, it really doesn't look like a black hole, the, the picture in the middle. And at the same time, you have like a la very, very large error uh, compared to the full array. And this unique characteristic at the Atacama Desert uh, has made Chile to develop the Atacama Desert uh, and, and to have a very long history with astronomy. Uh, and the first observatories in Chile arrived in 1849. Uh, the, those were astronomical instruments that came from the US and they were installed in Santiago. In those times in here in Santiago, we, we didn't have much light, so you could observe the sky. Um, and they were installed in 1849 for a short period of time of observation time. I, I, I believe it was like two or three years. And after that, the Chilean government bought this instrument to this, uh, uh, to, to this US scientists that were from the Navy and installed its first observatory. So we have like uh, 170 years of history. Uh, and the National Observatory was created around then. But the cluster itself and the Atacama desert itself started developing in the 60s, uh, where 
some directors of the uh, National Observatory and University and, and University of Chile at the, at the time started attracting observatories and showing the world that Chile was a very good place for astronomical observation. And in the 60s arrived the first two large telescopes that were the, the one of one of Europe that from the European Southern Observatory and one of the US that was uh, the Tololo that was the first large uh, telescope that were four meter telescopes. So that was the like the kickoff of the modern astronomy history in Chile, in Chile uh, and how it started to grow the cluster and to also generate different kind of effects in the Chilean uh, national scientific uh, ecosystem. And what we observed in general and in, in our research is that um, the development of astronomy in the Atacama Desert generates a lot of different kinds of spillovers. And it doesn't only promote scientific research, but it also creates all a, a very large range of different effects that interact among them. And that's the interesting thing about developing natural laboratories. That you don't have to only think on the science that will be conducted in it, but also you have a lot of different effects that, can, that come from the development of science and that you can use for the construction of a scientific and uh, technological policy and at the same time to develop the national innovation system in general. Uh, and for example, we observed that a lot of institutional change were generated because of the development of this natural laboratory. For example, Chile has the 10% of the observation time, time in every observatory. So we have a very uh, privileged access to observation time in astronomy. 10% is a lot. Uh, and uh, we have, but also we have the different uh, funding specialized for astronomy and not for only for astronomy but also for related sciences like astroengineering. Uh, we created government bodies to work with astronomy. Uh, for example, we have a, a, a astronomy di directorate in the in the uh, in a research and development agency. Uh, we have we had in the Ministry of Economy and Industrial Liaison Office to transfer knowledge from astronomy to industry and a lot a very broad range of institutions. But at the same time, you were developing knowledge through human capital, through uh, data science research and some other things. You were developing a, a, a new economic sectors, both from spin-offs from the technology that was developed at, the, at, at or for, for the uh, observatories, but at the same time creating new markets, for example, an astrotourism cluster near the observatories. You have technological infrastructure. We have very, uh, very good broadband connectivity to the north, and that's because the observatories, because they needed to connect to Santiago to send all the data to Germany in the case of the European Southern Observatory, to the US or to Japan in the case of the three different uh, largest actors in, in astronomy. So you you have like very high speed broadband to the north, and right now we are connecting the south also, uh, and and Chile in fact is the the most well-connected country in all Latin America. Uh, and at the same time, you were developing a social capital related to these observatories through different net networking activities to pre scientific preferential attachments uh, and different uh, things. And all these spillovers were related between them. And, and we constructed this pentagram uh, where you can see different examples. Uh, in our paper, we have a very long table with a list of examples because it's a case study uh, and you can see how they relate with each other. Uh, and some specific examples that are interesting, for example, you can see how explosive the growth in astronomers uh, in Chile has been. And that's around 2004. And what happened at the time, it's like the second generation of observatories, for example, Gemini, that it's a eight meter observatory, the, in, the initial construction of ALMA that was uh, inaugurated in 2010, but it, the operation, the construction study around 2000 and a lot of, of, of other observatories that were like the second generation observatories. And at the same time, universities uh, started to have the undergraduate uh, uh, career of astronomy. Uh, before the 2000, only University of Chile and uh, University, uh, Catholic University had astronomy. Right now, a lot of universities have it. So we have an explosive growth on astronomers in Chile. And why this is, is this important? Because 
astronomers are not only astronomers, but they are also data scientists and they could transfer to other industries as I will see later on. Um, also, astronomy is very representative of our country. If you can see at the right side, uh, astronomy and astrophysics is the, the scientific field that generates most publications in Chile. And at the same time, it's like a representative element of our, of our culture and country. This is our social capital spillovers that we call. Uh, for example, the, the, this is a ranking on how different things are representative of our country and Chilean skies and astronomy are the fifth and the sixth. Uh, it's a Bob Stoker, and this was conducted the year uh, after we won the second America Cup. So soccer was very popular at the time. And even though uh, Chilean, uh, Chilean skies and astronomy were above soccer and at the same level of poetry, and we have two Nobel Prizes in poetry. Uh, so, so it's very important for Chilean astronomy and Chilean skies. And if you ask any Chilean about observatories, this, uh, there's a study that uh, more than half of them will be able to uh, name correctly an observatory, usually Alma or Cerro Tololo, that is the oldest and the most famous. Um, also, we have like these different institutions that I mentioned, like the Tempest in Truth, New Bureaucracy, and different things. And something very interesting here is that institutions develop differently depending on the negotiations, and they took a lot of time to converge and to, and, and to have like the same rule for everyone. Uh, for example, in the case of, of the US, we negotiated Jose, are you there? I think you might have a connection problem, eh? connectivity problem. Since the first observatory is 10% rule, I can hear you well. Can you hear me well? Yeah, now you just uh, was interrupted for, uh, for a second, but now oh. I'm, again. I'm back then. Uh, well, I, as I was saying, that something interesting about institutions is that it, how they evolve separately. And, and, and for example, the 10% rule uh, was different in the negotiation with Europe and with the US. In the case of the American observatories, uh, they were negotiated by the University of Chile and they were incorporated since the first telescope in 1960s. In the case of Europe, they were not part of the negotiation at the beginning, so we lost the, that opportunity for 30 years. And they were only incorporated in the near the 2000, when the Chilean government negotiated the second ESO observatory, and they, they told them that the only way that they could include a new, a new telescope was to incorporate this 10 person tool in all the, in all the observatories uh, by the European Southern Observatory, including the one of the 1960s. Uh, but it was like a 30 year gap be before this 10% rule was uh, for every observatory. And right now, right now it's changing again because the new observatories don't have observation time. Uh, for example, the Vera Rubin Observatory, XLSST, uh, will observe the, all the whole sky and map the whole sky every three days. So it doesn't have any observation time. Uh, so the negotiations go more in access to data more than observation time. And that led us to how Chile is constructing right now its CI policy and, and how it's thinking about the future um, and how this experience with astronomy and with natural laboratories can help us to shape our national science and technology ecosystem. So two, two things that are important, and I will go back again, it's, this picture is the, the right now the Ministry of Science, the Under Secretary of Science, and the Chief of the uh, National Research and Development Agencies. It's uh, in that order, and and it's important because our Ministry of Science is very young. It was created in 2018. The ministry was appoint the minister was appointed in December of 2018. The ministry was officially created in October of 2019. Uh, so it's very, very young, and all these first uh, years of government, uh, the main task for the Chilean uh, Ministry of Science has been uh, installation. Uh, so it's very new. I, I was able to be in that first year and a half of operation. I, I arrived at the Ministry of Science in uh, July of 2019, before it was officially created, we were like contracted by another ministry to work for the Ministry of Science. Before that, I was at the Ministry of Economy, so I like uh, go, went to the Ministry of Science and now back to the economy. 
Um, so it was officially created in 2019. So it has it's like two, less than two years old. Uh, and in those two years, something that they had to do was to create the first science and technology policy. Uh, and that's the National Science, Technology, Knowledge and Innovation Policy that was released last year, uh, around March. It has, it's a year, or, a year old, more or less. And we created also, and I was in charge of it, our first national AI policy. And, and we released the draft of this AI policy, and I will talk something about it uh, in December last year. And right now they are finishing it, and it should be published during this first semester. Um, and something that we created also, we, first we started working this on the Ministry of Economy, and then we incorporated the Ministry of Sciences, the data observatory. And I think it's a very good example on how you can use what you have, for example, your natural laboratories, to innovate and to create like uh, scientific and, 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 and technological policies, uh, not thinking on what you lack, but thinking on what you have. And the idea of the data observatory was to create an institution that took advantage of this uh, large share of observation capacity that we had in Chile, uh, but not only for astronomy, but how we, can, how we could use this astronomical potential into other areas. And that was the question that we had at the Ministry of Economy when we started working on this and at the Ministry of Science. And we decided that the best idea was to create a public-private initiative, uh, something that took us two years, more or less, because it was finally, um, finally approved by, I don't know how to say this in English, by La Contraloría. <laughs> it's, uh, in, it's like the, auditing, the state auditing institution. Uh, last week, so it's like we celebrated last week because we finally had the data observatory officially approved. And so it was a very long way to create it because the, uh, the state is not used to innovation. Uh, less, it's even harder if it's institutional innovation, but if we, we succeeded at the end. Uh, so what we thought to create this data observatory first, it was that earth space sciences can converge through data science. And on not only Earth space, but this is a reflection that we have in a, in a, a very interested network in, in the States, is that data science can make different disciplines converge. And they not only converge because of the technology itself, but also because of the culture of scientists and technology development people that work, that work there. And, and, and if you think as data science as an interdisciplinary lens for convergence, you can create projects that make different uh, disciplines that may seem very uh, not alike to work together. Uh, but there is a lot of there is a lot of need to of support for this initiative, both from the infrastructure side and both from the uh, convergence side. It's not easy to make people see that, for example, space observation and satellites can, and, and, and earth observation and environmental science can work together. It's not, uh, it's not obvious. Maybe, maybe for me right now it's obvious because I've been working in this like the, like the five last years of my life, uh, but, right now, but I, I've seen how it's not obvious. And if you think on, I, I don't know, uh, astronomy and medicine, at, 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 if you start thinking on it, you, you can say there is nothing in common between astronomy and, and, and medicine. But then I can give you an example for uh, like that the Hubble algorithm for cleansing the lens is the same algorithm that they uh, use in the machines that detect uh, breast cancer. Uh, and that was a direct transference from astronomy into medicine, for example. And Earth observation is a little more obvious because you have like observe, uh, observatories that can observe skies and satellites that observe Earth. And if you are analyzing images and looking for things in images, the algorithms are not so different. You are looking for different things, but you can train them in similar data sets and, and, you, and you can develop similar math mathematical tools. So data science is a convergence instrument for discipline. And that was very interesting since we, can, we also saw how human capital related to data science was like uh, neutral to the scientific or technological area they were working in. And in the work of building this data observatory, we developed this model where you can see like four main tasks for data scientists. 
uh, when you work with data, you have to make analysis of the data. You have to acquire and, gen or, and or generate the data. In the case of observatories, you observe. In some case of machine learning experiments, you have to create synthetic data or anything, but you have to acquire or generate the data some way. Uh, you have to make to have the appropriate uh, institutions and, and mechanisms to access the data and to, to curate the data and everything. And then you have to have tools for explore, uh, to explore the data and to make visualizations of the data to make it useful for someone. Uh, and those different tasks are similar for any data centered industry. It's not astronomy, it's not environmental sciences, it's any, any area that works with data. And we saw how these data-centric activities in space and Earth observation are conceptually the same. And also we had we made a study at the time that we saw where that astronomy was, was five to 10 years ahead of uh, other disciplines in here in Latin America in data science. So if you think on retail, on retail or mining or, or forestry uh, or anything, astronomy is like five to 10 years ahead. Uh, so what we thought was that with proper institutions, this, all this knowledge that was being developed in astronomy could be transferred to other areas. Uh, and you can transfer it through human capital, for example, taking astronomers to work in other industries, and that's something that's happening. Uh, but you can also like generate data lakes in astronomy that could serve to train algorithms for other things. Uh, you can create algorithm from astronomy that can work in different data sets from other disciplines and so on. Uh, and with that diagnosis, we created uh, the data observatory. And we also developed a concept that where global value data set is that if you take data uh, you, and you can classify it on how easy it is to use the data and how much value the data has, uh, the data have. Uh, and if you have like this data that is hard to use, but at the same time is very valuable, and that is the case of astronomical data, because if you have like uncurated astronomical data, you have to have a PhD on astronomy to use it. Uh, but at the same time, it has a lot of value on how on the quality of data, on how complex it is, it, it is how if you take big data as a holistic approach, it's very large, it's very fast, it's, it's like all the bees, is, is, it has a lot of all the bees in big data. Uh, so it's a very, very good pool of data, but it's very hard to use. So if you can make it more accessible for other areas, you can exploit a lot of value from that data. Uh, and that's what the data observatory was designed to do. We thought on how we could create this public-private partnership that enabled astronomical data to be used in different areas. Uh, we launched an open call for investment in the case of the data observatory. The, the government put uh, invested uh, $5 million and at the same time called for investment. And Amazon is uh, an Amazon and a private university that is uh, Adolfo Ibanez invested among the, um, among the two, uh, between the two, 17 million dollars. So we have an investment of, two, of $22 million right now. And now that it's finally approved by the Contraloria, <laughs> Uh, it will make a new open call for investment for any other initiative since the idea of the data observatory is to be a neutral broker that enable astronomical data to be used in other disciplines and also to make this data converge with other data sources. So the first idea and the first mandate was to work in astronomy and, and, and here is the, like the model change that you have where any each observatory's uh, storage is data on premises, and then they took it online to a, a virtual observatory that doesn't work so well, and then it goes to the different astronomers. And the idea of the data observatory was to take all the astronomical data into the cloud, incorporate cloud technology in astronomy that is something that is not being used, and how any in the any people in the world could access this astronomical data and work with that astronomical data in a more friendly way. And that's it, the first idea. And, and you can enable in astronomy more uh, what is called uh, uh, archive research. Uh, but at the same time, you can uh, amplify the impact of this data, of astronomical data. But at the same time, the, the data observatory has been operating since last year uh, in very uh, 
low scale, this, uh, small scale, because it didn't have all the funding uh, secured because of Contraloria. Uh, and for example, it helped work on, co on our COVID data repository. Uh, and, and it was using the knowledge of astronomy and the engineers that were working at the data observatory had astronomical knowledge on how you can make accessible and, and, and open data repository for COVID. And right now, Chile is like a, a top five country on, on transparency and, and, and quality of COVID data. And it was uh, working on how you can could, uh, automatize uh, uh, access to health ministry data. It was a lot of politics also involved, and that was the job of the Ministry of Science there. But how you could take like these reports of the Ministry of Health and make it like a CSV available for anyone to work with. Uh, and, and also not only the healthcare data, but also transportation data, mobility data, and everything. And the data observatory created a GitHub repository where you can access any COVID data anytime you want. And we had a collaboration with MIT on, on, on this. It's and, and into creating a VIDA system that were, they were developing in a group that worked with Earth observation. And they, they created this model where you can have like this environmental model with vulnerability model in, and, and, and all these two predict and to think on what are the technology, what is the technology that would you can need and you can implement to face these challenges. And the idea is was to for, for the data observatory to work in this data and, and, and in MIT they use the data at the repository to create a model for Santiago where you can could, where you could simulate uh, like bed occupancy uh, or, or, or how the virus was going up or down and, and the quarantines and you can anticipate the policy measures that you will have to take. And also, for example, when to buy more uh, ventilators or when to buy more beds or, or uh, it was a model that was being developed there. And at the same time, the data observatory is working in an open data cube uh, with CSIRO, uh, that's the Australian uh, Science and Technology Agency. Uh, on how to use sat satellite data in this case to work with environment and, and to face climate change. And, and you have like this data cube that is a way of accessing environmental data in a very easy way and very usable way. And that's something that's an ongoing project. And they use this as an example to analyze a, a, a wetland in a, the Alto Andino wetland and that was impacted by the mining industry. And they, they could detect how uh, this this uh, wetland was impacted, and then how we started to recover it when uh, a sanction to the mining to the mining uh, firm was issued. So so they developed this data cube and this methodology on how to use this data cube in the cloud to detect this this change of direction in the uh, the destruction of the wetland. And here comes to a more generalized, and this is a. a and something that I draw in, in the last weeks on, on our work I've been doing, uh, on how we can think on, on, on the future or, or how we can do uh, some foresight exercises from these natural laboratories and trying not to think on this deficit logic, but into an opportunity logic. And here I, I like kind of, uh, of design three very general boxes that is foresight, enabling, and, develop, and development, is how you can think on the future scenarios from what you have in the countries, how our natural laboratories can make us think of future scenarios. If we have this Atacama desert that is unique for astronomy, also unique for, for example, solar energy, what policies you need to enable the development of the natural if you have a very, and that, this is not only for natural laboratories, if you have a very unique institution model, or if you have a very unique population that can enable something, how you can think from that to create a policy or a strategy. And that is a, a, a two-way street. So you can think on a policy and that will affect how the natural laboratory also or society works, and it's a continued, uh, a continued thing. And when you have this strategy, you enter in an enable box. You have to enable the development of the natural laboratory or, or whatever. Uh, when the, in the 60s, this, the, the ones that the, the people that led the promotion of Chile as a place to install observatories, 
they have a strategy and they went to the US to convince people that they could install the observatories here and also in Europe. And also they started developing things that were needed for the installment of observatories, such as broadband, uh, or in that case, it was not broadband, but connectivity. Uh, and, and, and also more than connectivity, in that case was to have a town near the observatories where you could take the hard, the hard drives and then you could fly to Europe or to the US. Um, and when you think on enabling different things, for example, I, I, I will show the, the AI policy, you have a lot of different uh, enabling factors such as human capital, such as technology infrastructure, uh, such as uh, in the case of, of of uh, AI data, you need data um, that will enable the development of the technology or the natural laboratory or wire. And from that enabling side, you go to the development side, how we can uh, develop this technology or this uh, scientific field or anything. And there you need resources in a broad sense, and you need uh, foster industry, you need, uh, I, I don't know, entrepreneurship, uh, you need more scientists, uh, so on. And at the same time, you need regulation. And, and here, I, we, we've had a lot of discussions here that are very interesting on, if, on, on discussing if re regulation is an enabling factor or not. Uh, and in the case of AI, we discuss it a lot. Uh, I believe that regulation is not an enabling factor most, most, most of the time, because science and technology usually they're developed with, uh, in despite of regulation. Uh, and usually regulation comes after. Uh, at the beginning, you have uncertainty. At the beginning, uh, you have you can try to anticipate, and there are a lot of anticipatory regulation initiatives. Uh, but if scientists want to develop something, they will go to the country where they can develop, and they will do it anyway. And right now, if you can think like in, in, in the geopolitical side, in the case of AI, you have different uh, countries and regions that are operating very differently. Europe is trying to anticipate and is regulating a lot and is lagging behind. It's lagging behind on development. And China and the US are leading the technological development, but they are, be, they are being very more, a lot more, uh, I don't know how to say this, but it's, they have been thinking a lot less on regulation and they try to uh, think, make things and they see what happens. Uh, and in the case of China, the state controls most of the things. So for example, on privacy, the state uh, doesn't respect any privacy. It's private institutions that respect privacy, but it's transparent for the state. Uh, so we, you have different models with different effects. In the case of Europe, they are lagging behind because of regulation, that they are being more careful. And, and, and I'm not judging, it can be a, bit, a better approach if you want. Uh, and from the development of, the scientific field, the natural laboratory, the technology or anything, you can detect new opportunities and you modify your natural laboratories or your society or your institutions that can enable new opportunities to think on, again, what you have in order to create new institutions, new policy or anything. In the case of AI, that's something that I worked on uh, this, until December and, and was the thing that I was working on in the last a year and a half in the Ministry of Science. Uh, we started at the beginning of uh, 90, in 2019 uh, on thinking what Chile had and also what other countries were doing. First to uh, make the point that we needed an AI strategy and then on what could that strategy have. This model, it's like a complex and a lot of arrows and boxes uh, that, that describe a little bit how the, the process was at the, at the end. And it's not updated uh, for the last consultation. This was until recent. Uh, as you can see, it's very complex. It was an iterative process. We changed the methodology and the process like two or three times because of the social riots in 2019, because of COVID in 2020. And, and, we, and we expanded uh, in each of those crises are uh, co-construction model and our public participation model. Uh, so it was a very iterative process on, on, on how we could uh, develop AI in Chile and how we, Chile could lead AI uh, research and development and also the, the ethical discussion uh, in Latin America. Uh, and we put the public participation in the center of this process. 
And that was something that was not from the beginning, but mostly because in the public sector, it's hard to make participatory approach, approaches in general, at least here in Chile, but in general in the world. Uh, but at the end, Chile has developed one of the most participatory police, AI policies in the world. Uh, there was a, an OECD report that I was reviewing last week, and, and the two examples of participation was Chile and Canada. Uh, most of the policy were very close. Uh, constructed with experts and, 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 and mostly with experts, but not with general public. We have uh, 1,300 people participating in self-convocated roundtable. It was, that was people that just gathered, discussed about AI, anything they wanted, and they gave all the, those inputs to us. And we have a lot of critics from the experts because of, uh, because of that. They were saying, why you would ask someone that doesn't know anything about AI about AI? And we answered, that no one knows anything about AI because right now we interact with AI every day. So even though someone could say, I'm afraid of AI because they need Terminator will come or, or, or I don't know, uh, that information for us as policymakers is very important because we know how we have to approach people with the policy. And if a lot of, a large share of the population believe that Terminator is coming and that is AI, we have a lot of literacy to, literacy to develop uh, before we implement regulation or we implement different instruments. Uh, and it's to educate people that AI is in their phones and every time they use social media, they are interacting with AI. Uh, so it was uh, very, very, uh, there were very interesting discussions in, this, in these round tables and they were very different. For example, we have a, we had a, a children round table on gender. And they, if they, if there were girls that gathered and talked about gender and children and AI. Uh, and that was a very unique round table. And on the other side, you had like the engineers, software engineers round table. And at the same time, you had the lawyers round table and, and a lot of people were tables. And we also gathered 400 people in regional tables. So think on how the territory characteristics uh, could help this uh, AI policy. And we also organized a series of 50, uh, 15 webinars that are here on different topics to make AI closer to the population and foster participation. And, and we show how AI is everywhere. And not only on like this very high algorithm thinking, but you can also have AI on astronomy, on science fiction, on literature, on psychology, on gender things on fake news and everything and how AI is right now a general purpose technology that really uh, is being used or developed for different areas and is a part of our lives right now. So it was important to make uh, AI closer to people and make them see that AI right now is not Terminator and it won't be Terminator for a couple of decades, I hope. Uh, but it, it is our companion each time we use social media, each time, each time we watch Netflix, we watch Spotify or anything. Um, and we created our policy. Here is the mission of the public draft. It has changed, but I cannot, I cannot show the one that is the definitive, but it, it's along the way. Uh, and something that is very interesting about the mission or the vision of the policy, this mission is being converted in, in, in kind of a vision right now, and there's a different mission of, of leadership. But the idea is, is that the policy is very focused on empowering citizens, not on fostering AI or filling the gap of innovation and research or anything. Uh, we didn't want to say we want more innovation, we want more AI. We said we want to empower our citizens into the development of AI but also to foster public debate about ethical, social, and economic consequences. And this is because as a technology, it is socially constructed. So we really need to reflect as society, what or how do we want to live with AI? And that was a very intense work on how you can uh, solve value tensions, for example, privacy against security, and that's a value tension that is not solved or explainability against security or against efficiency, that is another tension. And how you can solve this tension is through public participation and public reflection. Um, and that's something that has to be done. And, and we believe that it has to be done publicly and not solved by experts. 
that talk about everyone who is involved with the technology and, and who will evolve with the technology. Uh, when you think on automation, uh, it's not like, oh, the machines will come and will replace people. They will change the, the way we work. They will change the way we interact. And that is something that we have to discuss about. It, it's not just, okay, here comes the machines and you replace all the, all the people in the mind. I don't know. Uh, it's how you can take these people to other jobs and how, for example, uh, jobs like doctors or like lawyers will change forever. Uh, for example, all the, the desk work of a lawyer will be replaced in the next 10 to 20 years easily. All the diagnosis work of a doctor will probably be replaced in the next 10 to 20 years. Algorithms are diagnosing better than doctors right now. Uh, and probably the role of the doctor will will have will have to do more with uh, taking care of people or with human relationships more than diagnosis that is data analysis that algorithm can do much better uh, so technology is changing and shaping the society and at the same time we influence on how technology will be developed if we create a regulation on ai we will determine a path of where we want ai to be and that's what europe is doing right now that has released their regulation and and it's they are saying that well, they will protect people from the beginning. And for example, they are banning face recognition from the beginning. And there are only exceptions to face recognition that could be. That can generate positive things, but at the same time, they can generate negative things. Uh, when we have autonomous vehicles, that's something that will happen, I believe, in the next 10 years, we will, ha we will have to decide, and this is very terrible, who dies from a crash. And we will have to decide the autonomous vehicle will choose randomly, will choose the, the people that is walking, will choose the people that is driving. And, and that is a, something that won't be solved through technology. Will, it will be solved in public discussion. So how we construct this policy right now is very important on how we think about the future and how we decide a little bit uh, the, scenario, the future scenario we have on regarding to AI. Um, and this is my last sl slide, and I think we have some time to discuss. Uh, right now, wh what I'm doing in the Ministry of Economy is what we created this future and social adoption of technology, uh, which mission is to foster the development and the adoption of technology for economic development and the creation of solutions for social and, and environmental challenges. The idea of this unit was to, was to take together two areas of the ministry that were separated and how we could start thinking about the future from the economic lens. Um, we, had, we had in the, in the, in the past an economy of the future unit in the ministry. And right now there were inside the SMEs division, there was this uh, uh, SMEs digitalization unit. And right now what we did was to take these two units and, and mix them in one. So we, at the same time, can think about future technologies and emerging trends and how they will go from emerging trends into digitalization of SMEs. And that is the hardest part of digitalization because uh, a large firm uh, will die or will digitalize it first uh, out of need. Uh, SMEs is a, is a, different, a different case. Uh, and because of the COVID pandemic, uh, digitalization was uh, really ac has accelerated a lot. Uh, there are some estimates that uh, it, it advances the process of, of digital transformation in five to seven years, uh, in one year, uh, out of need. Because if you had a, an SME, uh, you couldn't sell anything unless you develop digital sell, sales channels. Uh, and so out of need, firms have become more digital in the last year. And we have to see how new technologies such as AI, such as blockchain, such as, uh, I don't know, um, quantum computer, computing in the future will affect the SMEs and how we can take them from uh, like this very uh, small place where they are right now, because they are, they are elite technologies, for example, blockchain, and take them into SMEs and to further adoption of technology. And, how we are doing that, how we are doing this right now, uh, we have like, we are one month old in this unit. So <laughs> we are very young. Uh, it's looking for 
piloting opportunities is like an experimental uh, exercise. We detect potential pilots of technology. We try to enable, enable the ecosystem around that technology and try it. And wh while we try it, we can extract conclusions for regulation, for uh, instruments or development instruments, and also to show uh, cases of failure or cases of success for other industry and other firms so they can know what is being used, how it's being used, and, and what the, thing, the impacts of that technology is. Uh, we are working, for example, in blockchain for natural disasters. We are trying to develop a pilot around there. We are working on a lot of, of things in the in agriculture, um, for example, things to use less water or, or that kind of things. Uh, we are right now developing a, a something that use bacteria to clear the to cleanse the air of it's like the I don't know how they are called. Uh, but it's like you can clean the air, for example, out of COVID. It's, a, it's an Israeli technology, and we are seeing how we can test it in places like Metro uh, and some different initiatives. So I, we're trying to test these new technologies and see what conclusions we can extract from that from that testing and how we can like uh, develop scenarios of use of these technologies to see if we need to work with SMEs right now for their adoption, or maybe to think on recommendations for two years, five years that for these SMEs to adopt this technology, or, or at least to, to know how to face this technology. And that was what that was, uh, that is what, uh, what I'm doing right now. Thank and you very much. Thank you very much, Jose. It was a really, really interesting